We're going to open this discussion with a few lines from Rudyard Kipling. We had a teapot and let it leak. Not repairing made it worse. Now we've had no tea for a week and the bottom's out of the universe. <laughs> uh, this is more or less the subject of our discussion. What's happened to the bottom of the universe? Always down through history, minorities have ruled. And today, probably 10% of mankind, maybe less, is administering the other 90%. Very seldom having any direct contact with the needs and problems of that vast majority. Therefore, at this time, it is about the proper moment to remind everyone that the greatest of all the world's potential resources is the human being himself. We are the one important factor in the survival of our way of life. We are also, to a large degree, important for the survival of anything else on the earth, and perhaps for the earth itself. And yet this tremendous common sense majority has little or nothing to say about the causes and procedures of our civilization. We are completely controlled by a small group of professionals. Now, these professionals are not necessarily evil. They are not necessarily foolish. But they are not in, in direct contact with the world they serve. They have gradually isolated themselves in ivory towers of intellectual superiority and gazed down rather benignly, if at all, upon the world which they are supposed to regulate. They are simply incapable of the job. In the last 50 years, we've had the greatest advancements in science and education the world has ever known, and we're in the worst condition it has ever been in. It is because our entire attitude toward survival has very little basic contact with the essential humanity which it is supposed to guide, direct, and advance. There is a new humanism that is coming up, which it seems to me is well worth consideration, and that is the dignity, right, power, and authority of the folk. The folk is the great mass of people, and in its own natural environment and with reasonable consideration, this folk is nearly always right. There is some basic value there which expresses itself through the simple and natural interests of average persons. The average individual wishes to be a good parent, a good citizen, and a good child. He wants to live in a happy environment. He does not really cherish animosities. He is not addicted to the desire to be killed in war, nor is he intentionally dedicated to an industrialism which gives him no opportunity to be a person. So all these situations means, mean together that the leaders are out of touch with their followings, and the followings, for the most part, have lost uh, acceptances of their leaders. We do not want the condition to continue as it is. And yet to not allow it to go on, we must search for new resources of solution. At the present moment, uh, we are depending upon science to develop the nuclear resources of the world, but they have found no way of disposing of the nuclear waste which threatens to destroy us all. Thus, an attitude which can permit this uh, to occur, that exceeds or excels its capacity to dominate the consequences of its contacts and 
contributions is simply no longer suitable to leadership. There has to be changes. And these changes can only occur when the human being realizes his inalienable right to be human and that he has within himself potentials that are far more real than any of the intellectual superstructure upon which he depends today. Man internally is part of the universe. He is part of the enormous diffusion of energies. He is as much part of the great plan as a star or a meteor or a comet. He is, if he can go within himself far enough, he can find the laws of his own survival. But he has refused to have the opportunity to have this researching within himself. The moment he arrives in this world, he comes under the influence of this strange leadership of infallible errors with which we have all been afflicted. He goes to school, but he is not taught to think. He is not taught to use his own resources. He is told to accept, to read the textbook and come to the same answer. If he does not come to that answer, he will not graduate. And if he will not graduate or does not graduate from school, then he cannot enter the institutions of higher learning. And if he doesn't enter those and become proficient in the beliefs that they hold and become a willing uh, perpetuator of the status quo, if he will not do all these things, he is an outcast. He is then regarded as simply being a mediocre person wandering around in vagaries. This type of situation is getting to be a little too difficult. We are all sympathetic as we see these great monuments rise to human ingenuity. We realize how young people can become utterly fascinated with computers, how they can also become entranced with the possibility of making a trip someday to the moon. These things are tremendous inducements and are passed off constantly as, in, as indications of progress. But no one is paying any attention to the sewerage. Out of these predicaments that we are passing through is a vast byproduct of waste, by, a byproduct of danger, of war, a by, uh, product of epidemical diseases, of disturbance of Earth's balance, of disruption of crops, all these things are the results of unthought-out programs in which no one is interested in doing anything except landing on a planet somewhere else and has no time or thought to take care of the planet that we live on today. Now, it's very hard to convince people that we should be more thoughtful in these matters. But as a press report after each other, and many of them, show the difficulties and the dangers of all these situations brought home to us almost every day. Something should be done. But the great remote body of the approved professionals does not pay any attention to these rumors at all. They arise from the unenlightened, whereas those of special privileges and special educational dedications go right on adding to the mess. So out of it, I think we have to find out where we stand in relation to ourselves. We have been given a terrible inferiority complex. The average individual bows hopelessly and helplessly before the wisdom of the elect. He is afraid to express himself because he will open his environment to ridicule. He is not sure of himself because he has been talked down from the time he was old enough to read and write. He is therefore in a confused state and has forgotten that of all the devices that man has developed, he will never develop one in as important as that which was bestowed upon him by nature himself. This is the burden that we have to study more and more carefully these days. If we are looking for solutions to problems, 
There is no use looking where problems are being made and never solved. If we want to find out how to survive, we must gradually discover what is threatening our survival and do what we can to correct it. Somewhere within the individual, if he digs deeply into himself, there is a mysterious faculty that perhaps we can call common sense. It is in, in likelihood the basic qualities of mind. It is that intellection which has been given to all of us by a power greater than ourselves. The mind is an instrument to be used, not to be abused. Its uses must always solve something. Its abuses must always tear down something. Now, the mind being a mysterious instrument which no one has been able to accurately define, and our higher professionals do not even attempt it, because to do so they would be forced to examine causes and factors they wish to ignore. But the mind remains as the one saving hope in this particular emergency. Somewhere within each individual is a kind of solutional power which should be cultivated instead of inhibited. The moment we find that a child has a mind to think with, we should help it to think with that mind. Thinking is very different from accepting somebody else's thoughts. Thinking is not to be gained simply by reading a textbook and agreeing with the author, or, for that matter, disagreeing with the author. The real fact of the matter is that every effort today is made to prevent the actual acted positive use of the mind. It is being cultured to become an instrument. We are trying to make the mind into a robot. We want to have a mind that will serve uh, situations that are essentially false. We want a mind that will agree with the prevailing policy, even though that policy is going nowhere. Actually, therefore, each of us must become capable of using the mind with which we have been endowed by a life greater than our own. Actually, the tendency to break away in, uh, uh, from the conventional and the conservative is growing every day. We are more and more aware that we are the victims of something that is not right. We realize as we stand closer and closer to the possible uh, wars of the worlds that have been well dramatized in motion pictures, we know something is wrong or these conditions would not and could not exist. They do not exist because humanity as a group wants them, or that they serve humanity in any way. They have continued because small groups of ambitious persons want to play chess with the human destiny. They are not concerned with trying to solve problems. They are inclined only to consider the possibility of further advancements in some highly specialized structure of munitional warfare. They are interested only in digging in and finding more abstract theories which they can turn to the uh, advantage of limited groups. Now, these minds have formed a partnership, or if they haven't formed it, it has occurred naturally, with other walks of life which feed into this monopoly. This, uh, these other walks of life, for example, example, one of them is the psychosis of wealth. They have tried to make every human being subservient to a colossal ignorance simply by offering a reward. They have uh, taken the attitude that if we will follow the leadership of the self-appointed leaders, they will help to make us rich, will help to make us famous, and will help us to become dyspeptics, or in one way or another destroy the body in which we live. Actually, we are told 
that if we think for ourselves, we will be poor. If we think as we are told to think by the elect, we may retire as vice presidents of some monopoly and have a grandfather's clock presented to us in recognition of 45 years of faithful service. Uh, my uncle got one of those clocks. <laughs> but these uh, years of faithful service, what did it do to him? It destroyed in him the entire structure of individual creativeness. He did what he was told. He went to office every day. He followed the rules exactly. He had a fair living and was able to support his family. And he passed out of this life at the end of 83 years without actually having thought anything through for himself. He had no idea of the kind of world he lived in. And for him, pleasure and success was to be able to take a ride in a sailboat. Now, this is what has been gradually happening. The sailboat has now become a yacht, a land yacht, and living has now gone into the multiple figures so that the elite can hardly get by on a million dollars a year. But with all this money, what is being solved? Nothing.